Hello everybody and welcome to another video from Gun Gamers. My name is Eric and we have a very fun, very special guest on the channel today. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you Eric. My name is Ben. Um, I am a 19 Alpha in the US Army, uh, which means I'm an armor officer specializing in like, tanks, recon, stuff like that. But I've spent my uh, pretty much entire career in an infantry brigade combat team. So we're going to talk about infantry stuff, like small unit tactics, uh, squad formation stuff as it relates to Milson West Airsoft and should be fun. Yeah, it's gonna be really fun. And uh, by the way, if you need uh, hand forged knives, Spangler Forge. Yes. Yeah. Best, best hand forged knives in Rochester, New York. <laughs> but we're gonna get right into it. Uh, the format we had kind of baked up for this video was talking about the basic squad formations in terms of their composition and then in terms of their movements. And considering that we have a subject matter expert here, I figure I'm gonna let you take that away. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So um, we're going to talk pretty much about the uh, Army's squad composition, which is reflected in Milsom West, as I understand. Um, I've only been to one Milsom West, so I'm going to be referring to Eric to tell me a lot of the details and stuff that I have not like fully experienced. But um, but yeah, like Milsom West uses uh, the squad structure, which is basically two fire teams, an alpha team and a bravo team, uh, and one squad leader for a total of nine personnel. Um, They'll also expand that up to 12 sometimes for, okay. uh, for sub-squads. Cool. Yeah. So, and then each platoon is going to have three to four of those squads, plus platoon leader, platoon sergeant, RTO, radio telephone operator, and all that. Um, but these squads are pretty organic, or pretty cohesive, I guess I should say. Uh, like, at Balkar, I was surprised that I was a squad leader, um, but we were together the whole time, and it was my job to keep them going the right direction. The teams maintain their um, cohesion in, throughout the firefight, which can be pretty um, unusual for a lot of airsoft games. Yeah, a, lo a lot of airsoft games, you don't get that same focus on the squad as the basic unit. A lot of people will show up, you know, to like <laughs> something that's a little bit less heavy on company level organization, and they'll just be like, oh, I've got my five guys, we're our squad, we're gonna go out and do our own thing. Milson West obviously is like, the squad is the basic unit and you shouldn't be doing anything with less than a fire team that still answers to a squad. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. You don't wanna get like left out alone in the woods cause that's, um, you're gonna get whacked. So yeah, so I'll just start um, basically talking about the basic fire team. Uh, the basic fire team is very simple. You have a team leader, you have a rifleman, a grenadier and an automatic rifle. Okay, so this is the fire team. Two of these make up a squad plus the squad leader. Um, and this is kind of a little self contained little team that you can then use to do really accomplish most mission sets. Um, naturally, the team leader is responsible for uh, managing the team. He makes sure everyone has their water, everyone changed their socks, and all that. But also when it comes time to actually shooting, um, he's saying like, get online, we're moving, you go first, I'll go second, all that stuff, um, and directs the fire of the rest of these guys. The rifleman is a rifleman. That's pretty straightforward. You know, he's got, if you're NATO, you've got an M4 of some type. If you are um, <clears throat> Rust 4, you've got an AKM or an AK-74M, whatever. Um, the Grenadier is where it gets a little weird. And unfortunately, as far as I understand, it's a little bit murky at Milson West and a lot of other games with the Grenadier role. I think Milson West does have, you know, technically there's a Grenadier per fire team, but the issue becomes that, you know, airsoft grenades are really expensive. So mm -hmm. more often than not, you kind of see them like filling out in squads where they can. Um, the Grenadier's role is basically creating, like doing longer range, longer, not long range, uh, indirect fire so it can arc over, whether it be a rock wall or whatever. Um, and it can also hit harder targets like bunkers or people in buildings and stuff. Um, and if you do it right, the Grenadier is really your key uh, enabling force to knock out hardened positions, defensive positions. Also great for anti-vehicle use. Yes, that's a good point. I forgot about that. Because uh, do you want to talk about the rules? Yeah, I mean, at, so at airsoft games, obviously, <laughs> like, you know, in the real world with you know, anti-tank capabilities, that's obviously a whole different level of specialization, mm -hmm. right? But in an airsoft game, you know, anti-tank or anti-vehicle really falls down to whoever can get their hand on tagons. 
Uh, so if you have grenadiers who have tagins, that's your anti-vehicle capability. Or if you can, you know, use foam rockets or 3D printed chalk rounds or work some of the stuff that's starting to come around. Some of it is more sketchy than others, <laughs> but you know, anti-vehicle use is a big reason to keep grenadiers in your fire team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because otherwise, if there isn't a way to take out a vehicle, you're kind of SOL. Yeah. Unless, of course, you know, they have to keep their windows down, like at Gungans yeah. Productions. Which is <laughs> really a mechanic. Really <laughs> um, okay, and then finally, you've got the automatic rifleman, which is my personal favorite role, because this is really the base of fire for a squad. This guy has, as the name sounds, an automatic rifle. So for NATO side, typically that takes the form of an M249. Um, Rust 4, typically RPK, RPD. Um, Although in the modern context, which we'll talk about in a little bit, the Russian forces have actually switched over to like a PKM series as their automatic rifleman, which is a little weird, but we'll, we'll talk about that later when we talk about like kit loadout and impressions and whatnot. <laughs> um, but the automatic rifleman, he is the guy that has full auto capability and the ability to really just lay down heavy fire. So you take contact, this is the guy that is just holding down the trigger. You know, don't break your gun and everything by doing that. <laughs> or do break your or gun. Or do break your gun. You're an adult. Do what you want. But he is a standalone rifleman, as compared to like a machine gun team where you have a big heavy machine gun and then a guy to carry the ammo and a, you know, setting you up, an assistant gunner. Um, this is a self contained automatic rifleman. And in historical contexts, um, sometimes this is used as like an assault rifleman where he's able to bound in a team. You know, you're not gonna put a, someone carrying a 240 Bravo machine gun in a stack going into a building necessarily, but you could do that with a 249. That has the capability of going in, even if it's a little bit bulkier, it has the ability to lay down heavy fire and to stay with the team and not have to be set up and mounted and you know, it can move pretty organically. But yeah, so that is your fire team. And again, the team leader is responsible for telling, hey, rifleman, go to that tree. Automatic rifleman, go to that wall and watch that um, sector and everything. And it's very much on the team leader to make sure that all these guys have the right weapon system pointing at the right application. So if you have a grenadier and there's only one way a vehicle can come in, have him face the, the road, you know. Whereas the automatic rifleman needs to cover the pathway in case you get a squad of rustle coming down the way. Um, and understanding where that is and being a little forward thinking is where the team leader shines and it's not just like a pickup game in your backyard where everybody's just running, you know, maybe staying together as a group. You want to be able to have like, be in control of your guys um, as you're doing that. Another critical thing that team leaders can do is lace reports. Generally, this will fall to the responsibility of the team leader and the squad leader and then they'll pass those up to the platoon leader. But lace report stands for liquid ammunition casualties equipment. That means that you know you're getting. Hey, does everybody still have water? Does everybody still have ammo? If not, like how much water and ammo? Hey, who took a hit? Do we need to like in airsoft context? Do we need to get anybody tourniqueted, or do we need to get anybody medic water, or do we need to go back to the respawn because we're not able to hit like a tenable defense right now? And then equipment is like, is anyone's stuff broken? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which never happens in airsoft. No, right? never. <laughs> <laughs> the finest quality. Um, yeah, yeah. And of course, the team leaders, you know, as I said, the teams are duplicated. So each squad has two fire teams that can move independently. Um, the squad leader manages the whole thing. So just like what Eric was saying with lace reports, um, lace reports are super important. Team leader gives it to the squad leader, squad leader then reports it up to the platoon sergeant, and it's you know uh, consolidated at that platoon level. So everybody knows, like the platoon knows, like, oh, we have this much ammo, can we or can we not conduct this mission and everything? Um, but we'll talk about platoon stuff in a different Oh god, way. that'll yeah, that'll be That's a whole a, other world. Melt your brain. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is how the squad is set up. Um, a typical, and this is based off of, to be clear, the American Army model. The Marine Corps model is a bit different. They're going through a weird transition right now, going from, I think, in 
The Army has nine. I think the current Marine Corps has 11, and they're going to 15, all set up with the M27 IAR, which is... That melts my brain. <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine having 15 people in a squad, let alone that means however many in a platoon. Yikes. And all of them having open bolt, full auto capable rifles. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, have fun with that Marine Corps. I, that, that have only, fun with the open play. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but before we go into like uh, actual like movement techniques and how this actually lays out on the field, quick talk for Rust Corps folks. Um, if you really want to do a real impression and like have a squad built like Rust Fort, um, it actually is not built quite like this. Uh, Russian doctrine is a bit different from Western doctrine in the sense that uh, the Russians really kind of abandoned the light infantry concept a long time ago in favor of just purely mechanized forces. So, okay, so. I wrote it in there, and Eric will put this fine graphic up from Battle Group. Awesome website if you want to learn more about this stuff, by the way. Um, but basically, the way the uh, Russian squad works is that they have their driver and the gunner for a vehicle, and then they have the squad leader. Instead of having two identical fire teams like most Western nations have, instead what they have is a fire uh, a fire group and then a maneuver group. The fire group is dedicated to like sitting in place and the maneuver group is the one that's dedicated to move around and you know, flank and all that stuff. The weird thing is that the fire group has four and the maneuver group has two. Um, another interesting note is that the Russians since the 08 reforms have not really been using the RP, RPKs, RPDs, um, in kind of the automatic rifleman role, uh, they've switched over so that their squads have a single machine gun, a PKM series machine gun, um, which is a little weird. That's a big machine gun as, you know. It's also the lightest modern, you know, battle rifle chambered machine gun. So I guess if you're gonna pick one. Uh, yeah, I guess you <laughs> could do that. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting choice, but also worth noting that this is the theoretical concept of what they say they're gonna do um, as current events are illustrating. Sometimes they don't have the vehicle. Sometimes, you know, you're gonna get whatever weapon they pull out of storage. Well, this yeah, yeah, so that I think covers all that. I'm yeah, gonna I think that's this. the basic squad composition. Obviously, you know, this is a very real life military theory squad composition. In airsoft terms though, it still applies as long as you have all these roles to play, especially Nielsen West does have all these roles and all of these things are relevant. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to, you know, go to a Milsim game, it makes sense to minimize and maximize your Milsim squad composition, especially because, you know, at Milsim West, they'll also allow you to have a designated marksman attached to your squad mm -hmm. if you want. And that's another thing that you can maximize for your usability for airsoft because now you got a guy who can shoot that much further than everybody and usually is going to be the guy who's less salty about lugging around a heavy magnified optic. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. At Balkar, that was the thing where it's like, oh, we got to do a little bit of a recon, everything go out this way. I'm immediately grabbing my DMR. It's like, you're coming with me because I've got a red dot in my rifle and you've got like a 8X magnified thing and I can't see like, you know, <laughs> yeah. Awesome to have the DMRs, like bring those guys into the fold. Um, but yeah, so I guess now we can talk about, you know, you've got your composition, you know who's playing what role, you show up. Now, how do you actually like move? Because you're not just gonna like get together, link arms and walk to the enemy. You actually need to move in a way that facilitates the end objective. The end objective being fighting the enemy and reacting when things don't go according to plan. So the basic format is, um, you would call it, the fire teams are going to be in wedge and they're going to be stacked on each other in a column. So what that ends up looking like is that, so roughly that's what we're gonna look like. We have one, two, three, and four, one, two, three, and four. So there are your nine individual uh, teammates that are then going to be going to fight. 
Uh, the reason we typically do this, this is the squat leader, that wasn't clear. The reason we typically move like this in the woods is because with the wedge, you have the ability to project firepower pretty much entirely to the front. Um, and if something, you know, a bad guy shows up this way, you can pretty easily pivot uh, to meet that threat. But <clears throat> if you know the enemy is to the front of you, you're gonna walk like this, everyone can see everybody, and then if one squad, or excuse me, if one fire team makes, uh, gets into contact, they start shooting, they go off online and start shooting in this direction, it leaves this guy to be able to maneuver left or right, depending on what the terrain says, depending on how many bad guys there are. Sometimes if you're outnumbered, you may just need to get online and plug a gap and then let the rest of the platoon uh, figure out how to best maneuver. Um, but you have to be able to make those movements to even be able to counter and evaluate. Because right. if you're moving just in one giant blob and you're not really that organized, then what happens is you just all die. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And it's worth noting, you know, to expand on that point, you need to have the spacing so that you don't become forced to engage. You know, I'm kind of drawing this ad hoc here, but ideally you're going to have, um, let's say 50 meters between groups so that if uh, you get um, an ambush right here, this is, that's a symbol for support by fire. Yes, yeah, support by fire. <laughs> uh, but if the enemy shows up and starts hitting you here, you don't want everybody to be in the kill zone. You want to be spread out so that you're, you know, the unengaged unit can support. Um, it's also you're... entirely possible if you're separated by 50 meters, especially in like a heavily wooded environment, they might not know this element's here. Yeah, and that's a good thing. The, the less the enemy knows about you, the better. Um, and so yeah, keeping that spacing is really important. Keeping the distance between the squad mates is also really important. There's a tendency when people walk through the woods, people get afraid of like getting left like alone, especially like <laughs> these guys out on the wings and they have a tendency to shrink back in towards the rest of their squad because they don't want to get left alone in the woods. Understandable, especially at night. Um, but you really want to maintain, like be as far spaced out as <clears throat> the terrain allows. Um, naturally in real life, you know, in a real combat environment, you, me being, you know, a hundred yards away from one of these guys isn't a big deal because I can shoot a lot farther than hundred yards. With airsoft, you're going to want to condense it a little bit because you don't want to be so spread out that, you know, someone could just sweep through and just pick you off one at a time. I feel like 10 meters is a good baseline. Yes. At least enough room that if a grenade lands perfectly between you two, like odds are good one of you isn't gonna be in the blast radius. Right, yeah, definitely. If you're able to like look at your buddy and whisper quietly to him, it, he should probably have a tough time hearing you. You don't wanna be so close that you're able to have like a full hushed conversation um, but naturally, the terrain is going to dictate a lot of it. If you're going through really, really heavily wooded areas, you know, you don't want to get separated by the terrain. You're going to collapse in. Um, and you can maintain that same formation um, just tight. Or, you know, if it's at night, especially if people don't have night vision, um, it's worth, you know, bringing it in a little bit. Everything gets a little bit closer. Uh, but then if you go out and suddenly you're in a big open field, spread out a little bit. You don't need to have the same spacing for all terrain you have to use a little bit of common sense to adapt and a really good squad kind of has that figured out everyone understands oh there's more space we'll spread out oh there's less space we'll shrink in everyone knows what to do in all these situations um and who to be looking for so um typically the um the we should also make it clear that this is like one basic squad movement context. Yes. There may be entirely other, you know, formations and movements that you use depending on the terrain, but if you're just like, your squad is walking through the woods, this is a good starting point. Yeah, so typically the way it's gonna work is the team leader is going to lead, the automatic rifleman is going to be on the weak flank, and you'll notice that they're alternating so that you have the ability to, you don't want to weight all your firepower to one side versus the other. 
Um, the automatic rifleman is going to be on the weak side because he has the most firepower. And then you've got your grenadier and your rifleman. But as you're doing this, you're walking through the woods, one of the biggest things that people struggle with is just maintaining contact with each other. Constantly looking around, you know, the rifleman is constantly looking all the way over here. Sorry, he's not traveling, he's looking over there. Um, looking for enemies, looking for weird things, looking for anything that he might need to alert his team leader for. But if he sees something, he needs to be able to get his team leader's attention. So the team leader is typically going to be taking five steps, looking around at everybody. Five steps, look around at everybody. And that doesn't mean like stop in place, but you'll see guys walking through the woods and just looking to the left and right, making sure everybody has visuals so that if anyone suddenly it's like, oh shit, I see something over there, like we can all stop and we don't accidentally like keep walking for 50 meters while the enemy's setting up an ambush and only one guy noticed, like we gotta be able to see and hear each other and communicate. That head on a swivel cliche absolutely applies. Here. Yes. And one of the other big things, I'm sorry, I'm no, gonna yeah. real quick, but when you're not walking in this formation, one of the things that I struggle with the most seeing at airsoft games is when people stop and when they stop, they have a tendency to stand in place. Why is that a stupid idea? Because anyone that may be observing you may decide like, hey, now's a good time to hit them because they're not moving, they're you know, open, they're vulnerable, and they're probably tired. And this is an opportunity for everyone to say, oh, we've been looking around. Um, if you stop, everyone thinks, yes, I looked around, I saw everything that there is to see, which is never true. <laughs> And it creates an opportunity to just get whacked. So if you come to an opportunity where, you know, squad leader needs to check the map or you're going to take a water break, cool. Like there's lots of reasons why you would do a short halt. Short halts are very, very simple to accommodate though. It's very much people just go to a knee and face outward. You know, these guys look that way. These guys look that way. If you have good opportunities for cover, whether it be a fallen log or a wall or whatever, just inch over there, take up a good spot, and just start looking. Sip on your water, take a break. You, they may even say, you know, drop ruts for a minute because we're, we're lost, we don't know where we are. That's a platoon level issue. But for you, you know, get in the position and be an asset. Don't be just the guy that just ruck flops on his back and just decides like, I'm gonna start digging out my candy bars and fall asleep. Like, don't do that. Yeah. The trick is you need to have some, uh, if you're going to get snacks while you're doing something like this, just have it in your cargo pocket. Yeah. Just be able to reach in, like grab out some dried fruit or something. <laughs> or if you're going to go through your ruck, at least just look out. Face that way. You know, just face in the direction where the enemy might be so that, you know, you can be aware of that and have that, um, be that much more aware of your surroundings. Because the enemy will continue to move even when you have stopped. Yes. So another useful formation that you'll see, it, typically when you do movement, you're gonna see this formation. That's, you can in theory also do uh, fire teams online if you're really looking to get maximum firepower out. Um, but that is very difficult to control because you have all these guys moving in the same direction and people take different strides and it's, these guys go faster, they go slower, and then suddenly we find that we're pivoting and nobody's checking a compass and it, it can be very difficult for that squad leader to, to control. Um, the more, the other very simple one for a lot of like long distance movement, especially if you've got roads, is just the, the tactical road march. Mm. Fight with that. And very much if you've got a road, what it's gonna look like is you've got a person here, a person here, person here, person here, and so on and so forth until you have your entire squad. Um, note that they are out of sync of each other. So when you're doing this, it's very easy to just, you know, if you're on a road, you know you may have a long distance to cover to go where you need to go. It's very easy to just look down at your feet, put one foot in front of the other, and just embrace the suffering, which is cool if you're rocking for a workout, not so cool when you may have enemy in the area. Um, so once again, these guys need to be focused out into wherever the enemy might be, keeping your head on a swivel, as Eric was saying, 
and maintaining that spacing. It's very easy, very, very easy, as people get tired to start bunching up, and then all of a sudden you look to your left and right and you've got you know someone right there on your uh, <laughs> at your shoulder, and then maybe you're stepping on the heels in front of you, which I know artillery isn't that big of an issue in Milsim, but at the same time, I mean, hey, you, we don't know. You know, maybe there's a system for it coming. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and you know, grenades are always a thing, or just a big fat burst of machine gun fire, you know, which is real easy if you've got four guys condensed on each other. Oh, yeah. Um, it also, if anyone is observing, and this is my recon brain going into effect here, but um, the more tightly you pack up, the easier it is for the enemy to say, oh, that's an entire platoon, or that's the entire company coming this way. If you spread out, you have a lot more freedom of maneuver, you have a lot more opportunity for things to develop up here and these guys down here to respond, just like we were talking about with the, uh, the wedges going up in columns. Um, so keep that spacing, um, make the enemy have to work to figure out exactly who you are, where you are, and how many of you there are to go with it. Make the game harder for your enemy, that yeah. is always the goal. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, any other formations? I you think want that's. To I, I, so, so the formations we've talked about thus far, I feel like the you know most relevant in terms of you know airsoft context, obviously, right, is your staggered column is going to be very good for when you're doing your ruck marching, right? Mm -hmm. At Milsim last year, your ruck in and your ruck in and any movements along roads, that's going to be when a staggered column really comes into play. But any time that you're moving and you may be moving to contact. That's where your standard squad formation is going to really come in handy, especially because then it's that much easier for you to, as Ben was saying, you can set the front element and then you can maneuver the other element. And in real military and in airsoft military, just getting around people after fixing them in place with suppressive fire is just a cheat code half the time if you're good at it. So just do that. So this, the purpose of these formations, right? The purpose of everything that you're doing is to set up the next thing that you want to do. There's an intentionality to the movement and you're always thinking about how is what I'm doing right now going to benefit the squad and the platoon? And that comes down to, especially when you're keeping your head up and trying to observe, when you take a break and you stop and you're like, okay, cool. Now I'm just gonna keep my head up and you know, take a knee, get low to the ground if I can and seek cover. And that makes it where everything you do has a purpose and an intentionality behind it that sets up that if you take contact, you're in the better position to react to it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I guess with that, we can really go into more of the simplified forms of the tactics, right? Mm -hmm. So and we touched on it already, but if this is what your Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, so this is your fire team, right? You're moving through the woods or wherever and everything and you take contact. Um, good Lord. I hope you edit this to make me look like I'm just a drawing extraordinaire. <laughs> I want to leave this so part leave in. That in. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so your enemy shows up. Uh, that's a symbol for enemy if anyone didn't know. Um, and they start shooting at you. Naturally, these guys are gonna get on line here. The one, the fire team that's not in contact can go left or right to set up an adjacent uh, support by fire, uh, excuse me, an adjacent firing position. And then from this kind of setup, you're able to shoot at guys from two different angles. So if you've ever been um, shot at from two different angles while trying to stay behind cover and also return fire, you know how difficult that can be. So putting your enemy in that position is always a good thing to do. That's not always possible if this turns out to be a full company and you may end up just getting on line to also shoot at these guys. Um, but this is very much the battle drill one alpha, the classic squad attack. Um, the shake and bake as you will. Yes, yes. They, you know, this is most folks, um, if they've never seen it actually drawn out, um, it's still a pretty intuitive action overall. Um, what may not be as intuitive, I'm gonna redraw that again, um, is the react to contact. And react to contact, 
um, you know, can um, take the same form of like, oh shit, like they're right in front of us, engage, flank. You know, that's great. Other times react to contact may be the form of an ambush, where instead of showing up right there, the enemy is showing up right here, and they are hitting the flank. These guys are going to have a bad time because they're probably walking through the woods, not behind cover. The enemy is going to be right there. The rules of react to contact are very simple, and if you can hammer this down with your squad, you can get really, really good at responding to really, really shitty situations like this. Um, the rule is very simple. It is return fire. Immediately return fire and try and gain fire superiority, and that's where those automatic riflemen really come into play of just laying down the heavy fire. Once you get return fire, try and take up as covered and concealed positions to like actually start shooting back. Um, and while that's happening, the group that's not fully committed can then maneuver around and hit the enemy from their flank. Um, that is ideally how it goes, and if you do it right, um, you can overwhelm the attackers, even if they have an advantage. Um, you can overwhelm them with your fire and your aggression and put them on the back foot. But none of that can happen unless you get that fire superiority. And that's really a big thing of just tactics overall. You know, as much as we like to, you know, play the game of like sniper, one shot, one kill, all that cool stuff and everything. It's like, no, shoot them a lot. <laughs> shoot them a lot and don't stop shooting until they stop shooting back at you. Especially with Airsoft. Those guns do not do a great job going through yeah. the brush and whatnot. Just keep on shooting. Right, right. And there's no one calculating your accuracy percentage. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's worth noting, too, when we talk about this, that we're really referring to essentially suppressing fire. Uh, a lot of folks, you know, especially in ambush, they are concerned because they don't know, um, like, oh, they're shooting us, but I don't know where they are. I can't really see them. I can't get a good shot. Doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter. It doesn't matter. Just shoot. Because really, it's you know, it's not like a real situation where you know, the bullets are cracking overhead and everything and dust is kicking up. But everyone knows what it's like to get shot with an airsoft gun. And when BBs start like, flying kind of close to you, suddenly you start getting a little more timid. You start hugging and cover a little bit, and you start shooting a little bit slower. So even if you don't have a rough idea, uh, like you could go read like the army manuals like they don't actually say shoot the enemy they say shoot at suspected enemy positions yep you know bushes trees even if you know they're like taking cover shoot at those like around the trees get those uh spots where you think that it will have that effect make it so that if they're hiding behind a plywood barricade or something make it so that it whacks off and you get those like heavy heavy hits because that makes them a little bit slower to get up and poke their head over because nobody wants to get shot right in the forehead. Well, and if you're able to overwhelm the enemy position with, you know, your BB fire, that also keeps them in an advantageous <laughs> position for your people yes. that are reacting to the contact and actually doing the movement. Yeah. And when you're actually doing your movement with your react contact or your battle drill 1A, you know, you're not always going to go left or right. Like, maybe it's more advantageous for your guys, you know, you could obviously come in and probably when you're reacting to contact, it's easier just to go for the most direct route, unless maybe mm -hmm. there's a major situation that makes it where you can't approach on the side, like it's a cliff or something. Mm -hmm. Maybe then, you know, for airsoft terms, it might be beneficial to try to hook around or try mm -hmm. to hook around back and button hook them somehow. But then for, you know, that's gonna be, oh my God. But that's gonna be dependent on terrain yeah. and what's going on and what's happening. Yeah. and. Also, you wouldn't do that in the real world because you cross behind these guys and now they can reach you. Right. And it's worth noting, too, especially with airsoft with closer engagement distances and everything like that, there's nothing, if they're close enough, these guys can just pivot on their heel and just assault. Mm -hmm. They just go. Um, a lot of times, like, you're, if they're really that close that you can assault, you've probably seen them already and then you're, you know, less likely to be really in an ambush. Um, but if they're just like suddenly pop out, like turn, lay down, heavy fire, and just start assaulting through. Um, and then these guys can come clean up the mess and catch like anything else that needs to happen. Um, I think the main place you really see a lot of ambushes at Milson West, right, is going to be on roads and trails. Because everybody wants to stick to roads and trails because those are the easiest mm -hmm. to move through. 
but then you stick to the roads and trails and those are the easiest to ambush. Yeah. And now you've got guys just set back in a tree line, you know, in a ditch and one squad can wipe out like a platoon of people in the open in the road, especially if they're not observing spacing and don't have good reactive contact. Yeah. So that's where it's really important to make sure that you have a reactive contact, you have a spacing, you have, you know, not a whole gaggle of just one platoon and a giant, you know, group, which I see way too much of these games. We're trying to fix that. But, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and that's the thing we were talking about earlier of like, you know, ideally you guys have time during staging and check in everything to get with your squad mm -hmm. and be like, okay, guys, everyone understands these principles, right? Everyone can draw, like, you understand what the fire team is. Um, and it's okay if you don't because you're like most people, and if you've ever done just like normal casual games, yeah. so it's just, that isn't a thing. Um, but, but it, it's easy to um, to kind of overlook a lot of the stuff because like you can watch videos like this, you can watch a million videos, understand the theory and read all the manuals, and everyone in your squad also agrees and understands. But if you don't actually like talk through it and do the, all the planning considerations, and you know if you don't actually say like oh. Based on the terrain we're going to encounter, we're probably going to assault to the right, or we're going to flank, you know, understanding the actual environment you're in and actually having that conversation of, like, everyone understand, everyone look at each other's eyes and say, like, yes, I'm comfortable with what we're about to do, um, goes a long ways in just reducing that um, time to react, you know, because if you don't, suddenly ambush happens, suddenly contact to the front happens, suddenly you get there and you're ready to do your ambush or do your squad attack on the building and everybody is just looking around at each other, not knowing who's gonna go first and you know what did they say, what was this contingency and all that stuff. If you can iron that out ahead of time and make sure everyone's on the same page, it goes so, so far to just building that you know collective picture. It's yeah. not sexy, it's not fun, it's not fun to like, okay guys, Let's come look at a drawing before we go. Everyone wants to like compare guns and talk about cool stuff, but. Well, but I do think that, you know, if you want to like play the game aspect, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, everyone wants to geek out about their guns and their gear and all that stuff. But if you actually want to like become competent at the force on force game that Airsoft is, it benefits you a lot to look at this like a playbook. If, yeah. you know, if not even like, oh, I'm not that interested in like military stuff. It's like, okay, but this applies really well to the game that you like to play. So maybe it's worth taking a look at. <laughs> yeah. And it's one of those things where like, if you can nail this down, you can be a really, really, really powerful force and your buddies can really roll hard on the enemy. In the inverse, if you don't pay attention to it and you neglect it and you just hand wave and say, yeah, we'll figure it out when we get there, high probability that you're gonna get really, really messed up and you'll get whacked and before you even realize it, you'll be on the back foot and then you'll be shot and then your medic can't get to you because you're too close to fire and then you bleed out and all that stuff. And, and that's not fun. You well, want to win, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh, so is there any other like finishing notes that you want to add? I think the only thing I'll add is if you want to like go on a deep dive and really nerd out about this stuff, the primary reference for this stuff is ATP 3-21.8. That is the army manual for the infantry rifle platoon and squad and everything and they just redid it a few years ago so it actually has phenomenal like illustrations and graphics and everything it's not like the old manuals where you can barely make out what they're doing like it's actually a really good manual and it's only like 1200 pages so it's a quick afternoon read <laughs> um, yeah it's, it's massive but it's it's easy to find you can find a pdf online or you can buy a hard copy on amazon for 15 bucks if you want it's worth a look it's cool you know? The Army's diagrams are pretty easy to understand. I'm not even yeah. like this versed in this stuff. And when I read like the battle drill diagrams, I'm like, oh right, you send guys that way. Yeah, it's easy. It's uh, it's made for the lowest common denominator. So yeah, so you can learn a lot. Um, don't hesitate to nerd out. And you know, I nerd out all the time. It's fun. Yeah. I mean, that's what this is for, right? It's <laughs> airsoft. It, airsoft and Milson. It's all for fucking nerds. Mm -hmm. Well, if you are a nerd and you enjoyed watching this nerdy video, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. <laughs> if you uh, enjoyed the video and you want to see more with Ben, uh, definitely hit that like button and give us a comment telling us how awesome Ben is. Because I can keep talking about all sorts of nerdy stuff, so if you like that, I'll come back. <laughs> and 
we have a real quick, not sponsored, sponsored segment of guess who? Spangler oh, yeah. Force! I made that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm not just saying nice things he's standing right here, but yes. Spangler Forge makes really incredible <laughs> fixed blade forge knives in a variety of sizes. This happens to be your camp carry model? Or? Yeah. Yeah, kind yeah, of like... Daily carry, smaller, yeah. A, a camp everyday EDC. Carry, yeah. yeah, it's great if you want a fixed blade EDC or if you want a small little camp knife that's tough enough to do a wide variety of jobs. Uh, but that is our video on basic squad composition and movements. Yeah. And I think it went pretty well. So yeah. once again, I have been Eric from Gun Gamers. And I'm Ben from Spangler Forge. Slash TF Keg slash TFK, yes. Rochester, New York. You'll see me around. Represent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.